Welcome to the Momsiety Club podcast. I'm your host, Tori Levine, and I like to think that I can keep calm in a difficult situation based on my background working in a psych hospital. But when I had kids, I was constantly questioning if I was doing things right or how I was messing them up this time. Add in a child with a chronic illness and I found myself full of anxiety. Momsiety is a real thing for every new parent, and when you add in a chronic illness, food allergy, or other challenging circumstances, it can become downright isolating. And that's why the Momsiety Club is here for you. Each week, we'll discuss all things motherhood, so join me and let's get rid of this momsiety together. Hi, welcome back to the Momsiety Club podcast. We were on a bit of a hiatus over the summer months uh, while I was trying to maintain my anxiety levels with uh, camp and summer plans and the ever-changing COVID-19 situation. Well, it's already September and we're back to school and it doesn't seem like anything is going to be stable for a little bit now, but... I am so excited to be able to share with you an interview that I did with Dr. Bridget Young, who is an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry. She leads a human milk research lab that studies how bioactive components of breast milk impact infant growth and development. Dr. Young is part of a national team that has responded to the COVID-19 pandemic to study the SARS-CoV-2 virus and antibodies against the virus in breast milk from COVID-19 infected moms. And you'll get to hear my conversation with her about the study about the vaccine for COVID-19 and how if there are antibodies present in breast milk of vaccinated women. Before we get into the interview, just a few things to make sure that you are still getting updated from the Momsiety Club podcast and Momsiety Club. Make sure that you hit subscribe in whatever podcast app that you love to listen to in. You can subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Momsiety Club. That's M-O-M-X-I-E-T-Y Club. And when you head to themomsietyclub.com, you'll be able to get a free printable of ways to help reduce momsiety as well as access to tons of free resources and information about ways that you can use movement to calm your momsiety. And if you're looking for a little more help on ways to manage your momsiety as well as restore your core and pelvic floor after having your precious little one, there's information on the momsietyclub.com about working with me one-on-one. All right, without further ado, here is my interview with Dr. Bridget Young. Hi, Dr. Young. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Momsiety Club podcast. Oh, my pleasure. I'm happy to be here. Well, I found you again through something I talked about a couple of weeks ago with the New York Times article all involving breastfeeding and the COVID-19 vaccine. And there has been so much discussion about that as well as I know for the past year, if a mom has COVID, is it Mm -hmm. safe for them to be around their little one to breastfeed them and so on? So could you please just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into studying everything with breast milk and COVID-19 and go ahead. Sure. I'd be happy to. So my background is in pediatric nutrition. I have a PhD in pediatric nutrition and have been studying human milk composition for a very long, longer than I would like to admit. (laughs) So before the pandemic and now currently, I still have a primary focus of studying how bioactive components in breast milk affect the baby. So hormones, growth factors, and of course, variation in your standard nutrients. So when the pandemic hit in the very, very beginning, think like March of 2019, we didn't know anything. And there was a lot of concern in the medical community about what the heck do we do if a mom is positive and is delivering a baby? And of course, in medicine, you always want to make evidence-based decisions, but when there's no evidence, it was like a free-for-all of trying to help 
these providers provide the best care and keep both mothers and babies safe. So I initially got involved because I have expertise studying human milk. And the very first thing we wanted to know is, could this be a transmission risk to the infant? Because mothers were being separated from their infants. And of course, we never want to do that un- unless it's absolutely medically necessary. Right. So that's, yes, that's where I uh, got involved initially with the COVID-19 research. And of course, that research, as we have learned more, has evolved to be more of a focus on antibodies that can be present in breast milk, how those may differ between if a mother is infected or if a mother has a vaccine. Um, so I would love to talk about any questions you have. So first, can you, I don't want to say dumb it down, but that's how I talk. So, uh, bioactive, you said hormones, yes. growth <laughs> factors, like what all goes into that? Yeah. Do you want me to introduce myself again? And no, 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 just okay. give us a little, a little more in layman yeah, terms. Absolutely. So when I say bioactive factors in breast milk, I'm talking about all of the non-standard nutrient components in breast milk that, for lack of a better word, make breast milk so awesome. So for example, breast milk is full of all different kinds of hormones and growth factors that help a baby to develop. You know, anybody who's held a newborn baby knows like, Lord, they come out with a lot of maturing to do. (laughs) And all of those hormones and growth factors in breast milk are one of the reasons that we recommend breastfeeding if possible. Another bioactive component in breast milk, which is really relevant to COVID-19, are all the different immune factors that help keep breastfed babies healthy. So these are things like immunoglobulins, cytokines, like all these tongue twisting (laughs) molecules that are floating around our own bloodstreams, fighting off infections, keeping us healthy. Mothers secrete a lot of these factors into their breast milk. And it's one of the reasons breastfed babies are protected against infection very early in life when their own immune systems are really immature and often not able to handle fighting off viruses and bacteria on their own. Okay. Well, thank you for that uh, explanation. So what what were the findings about breastfeeding if mom had COVID-19 and transmission? Yes, this was really exciting for our group because it was one of the first times during the pandemic we actually got to deliver some well-earned good news. So as I mentioned earlier, our first concern was, is there actually any virus present in milk? Because that would of course pose a risk to the infant. So we were able to study a group of mothers who had just been diagnosed with COVID-19. So within the first two weeks. So if we were going to detect viruses was the most likely time we would be able to. And we detected zero, not a single sample had any SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, any detectable virus in the milk, which was incredibly relieving news because it means that not only should we be keeping mothers and infants together, but we have no reason to think that this milk could be infectious. Right. Yes. The other really exciting thing that we found is even when mothers were actively ill, like these poor moms in our study, you know, coughing, headaches, the whole nine yards, even when they were in the peak of their illness, their breast milk still contained specific antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. So antibodies that protect against the virus. And then we were able to take that detection a step further. And in a lab experiment, we're able to test how these antibodies act. So it's one thing to say antibodies are there, but it's a whole different thing to say those antibodies are still active and they're still working. Mm -hmm. So we are able to, um, to test this out in a, in a, in a lab, in a model. Um, And what we found is that the vast majority of these milk samples from moms who have an active illness did in fact neutralize the virus. So the antibodies were able to bind the virus and keep it from infecting on a plate in a lab, which gives us pretty good confidence that in fact, this is protecting the baby, of course, is what we're ultimately concerned with. Yes. So it was really relieving to see that mom's if they're able, should absolutely still provide breast milk to their infants and feel really good that they're likely providing a protection to their baby during that time. That is wonderful. I love hearing about that test where it 
neutralized the cells in the yes. because not even to my group of moms, but just other people that I've spoken to uh, throughout this time, we love talking about all that, the different science and how things are being developed and uh, love it. <laughs> is that what they're doing? You know, so now hearing it from a source is wonderful. So let's see, where was I? I had something that I wanted to ask based off of that with a newborn baby, because that's, you were dealing with mothers with very young babies. Zero to six months, zero to six months. So yes, still not necessarily newborn, but little, little Little. freshlings. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Now, is there anything that says like, well, at a certain point, because of how much breast milk mom is able to give baby or babies receiving, Mm -hmm. if they're having solid food, Mm -hmm. or even if mom is having to supplement with formula that says, you know, this is the, the hard and fast line where we say you're still getting some of that Mm -hmm. antibody protection, but we want to have you be a little more cautious. Sure. Okay. Well, the short answer to that question is we don't know, uh, that we just are nowhere near being able to do those studies right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say I am an academic, so I'm happy to ramble on on the topic and give you kind of our insights of what we think is likely occurring based on the biology. Mm -hmm. So the first thing to understand is these immunoglobulins that are in breast milk that are the protective factor. They act by literally just binding the virus. You can think like a little Pac-Man mouth binding the virus so that it can't cause an infection. This means that once And then that's excreted in the stool, you're done, but it's not infectious. It's not something to worry about. But that means that when breast milk is not provided, there's no protection. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that's long lasting. It's only lasting as long as the baby is consuming the milk. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other is that from what we know just about how infants develop over time, it's likely that the degree of protection decreases slightly as the baby ages. And the reason I say that, again, this hasn't been studied, but the reason I say that is as babies develop and as they get closer to six months and are ready for solid foods, they're ready for food. Their stomachs are more acidic. Mm -hmm. Their intestines are more mature. Their own immune system is more mature, which is great. So it's likely as those things happen, these immunoglobulins that are in milk are digested a little more than they are for the newborns who are like, you know, barely doing anything for themselves. <laughs> so for example, I would never recommend that you take milk that was expressed if a mom had a newborn. I've had this question a lot. Well, should I split some of the milk and feed it to some of my two-year-old to provide them protection? The research, there's no research, but my personal recommendation would be no, feed the milk to the newborn baby because based on what we understand about biology, they're more likely to have a benefit. And a newborn, think about a newborn who's exclusively breastfed. Their quote unquote dose, how much milk they're receiving per pound of body weight is way, way higher Mm -hmm. than an older baby or toddler who's receiving, as they should be, lots of other food. So their dose is more diluted. So you're more likely to have, um, you know, a concentrated protective effect in that tiny newborn baby. Uh, I love where you went with that because that was going to be another follow-up. Oh, well, we've been getting that question a lot. Yes. And again, I want to emphasize, that's just my personal interpretation of the science where the evidence is far behind. I mean, we're just still scrambling to keep up with COVID as it continues to unfold. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. It's just good though, because I, this is the Momsiety Club podcast. Moms are anxious who listen to this. So I'm a mom. I'm anxious yeah. about it. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, well, what if I could give this to my other child who's older, if it could help a little bit, but then sure. adding all that extra pressure of pumping or I remember in that article from the New York times about relactating moms are trying mm-hmm. to relactate, like mm-hmm. is it really worth all that extra pressure. Mm-hmm. And what I'm hearing <laughs> is do what you have been doing and don't add on, um, which I will 100, I will share right before that article came out. Actually, my husband and I were talking about it. And we were like, maybe you should start pumping again mm-hmm. to like give some um, older child who has a little bit of immunocompromised 
okay, what's sure. going on? And I was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> tried it once. And I was like, this is, I can't do this. I can. Yeah. Well, do you know what your child needs? They need a mentally healthy yes. mother who can be present and is not completely drained by trying to relactate. And again, we for those older children, whether or not that protection is really able to happen for them in their intestines, because their intestines are much more like an adult's, we don't even know if it's if if that protection is there. Right. Right. Well, it's always good to hear. Uh, yeah. So we'll say, so do what you're doing, right. wash your hands, right. wear your mask, you know, keep, keep that. So we, those are things that we know that works for those, especially those immunocompromised older kids. So keep up that great work. <laughs> well, thanks. Now going to the vaccine, mm -hmm. uh, you studied composition of breast milk after women were vaccinated. So we have, we have not published those results yet. Oh. So we have, I know, but I can talk a little bit. There's been very few, but a couple studies of other groups that have, um, that have been able to publish a really little bit. So before I say that, I want to give a props to like all the moms listening, but if any moms who are participated in our studies, we recruited women in December. So it was only healthcare providers having access to the vaccine at that point. And we recruited 30 women in a week. I mean, these moms came out of the woodwork, just altruistically wanting to help. I'm breastfeeding. I'm a nurse on the COVID unit. Can I give you milk? Can you study this? I mean, I was so touched, <laughs> like bringing tears to my eyes, thinking about yeah. how altruistic these moms were. Um, and you realize how many lactating moms are in healthcare, all the nursing staff, which is primarily female-based. It was just such a beautiful moment to see people pulling together to do anything they could to improve our understanding. So yes. Well, thank, thank you, you to all the moms listening. Yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but what we know from others and that we'll be publishing on soon as well is that you do still, it's what you would want to hear. You do still see those immunoglobulins in breast milk after having received the vaccine. So there's nuanced differences, of course, in the timing and in what immunoglobulins are in breast milk, which I'm happy to go into further if you want. What we haven't seen yet, it's still too new. No one has been able to conduct those neutralization assays. So using cells in a lab and adding virus in milk and seeing if the antibodies in the milk are, are able to be active. You can imagine that happens in a biosafety level three lab with very, because they're using live virus. Mm -hmm. So they're very hard to conduct. So our lab is actively doing that now. And we're really excited to be able to share the results. But until now, we others have shown that the antibodies are present in milk. And if you want to talk about how it differs from the infection, I'm happy to do that. Sure. I love this kind of stuff. So. Okay. Um, yeah. Is it as effective? I guess, but I guess you're still studying that. We, so that's we what we can't yet. say. Yeah. Right. And that's and just because nobody's been able to do it. And I know our lab is working on it and several other labs across the country are, are very actively prioritizing this work. So the, the difference in, we're getting really nerdy signs here. So I love this. When you have an infection, the primary antibody that ends up in the milk is IgA, immunoglobulin A. So immunoglobulins come in three different types, immunoglobulin A and G and M. So if you have an illness, you primarily secrete all the different types of immunoglobulins against SARS-CoV-2, but it's primarily immunoglobulin A, which is the predominant immunoglobulin in breast milk in general. What we're finding is that after the vaccine, you start to see immunoglobulins in breast milk, roughly, studies differ, but I'll say roughly around two weeks after your first dose. So it's not immediate. It's not like the next day, your body needs time to right. produce immunoglobulins. And you do see um, immunoglobulin A and immunoglobulin G in breast milk, but over time, it's an immunoglobulin G predominant response. So it's a different class of immunoglobulins that seem to be hanging out longer in the breast milk after vaccination. And the longest study that we've able been published is about three weeks after the second dose, which is not that long. So yeah. good news, antibodies are totally still there. <laughs> um, 
bad news, obviously we're continuing to follow these women longer and we'll be very excited to show that hopefully those immunoglobulins stay, but whether or not having this IgG, immunoglobulin G predominant response in a vaccine versus an immunoglobulin A predominant response with an illness, whether that affects the neutralization or the activity, the protective effect of the milk, we don't know yet. That is very interesting. So are you able to share? Do you know when your study is going to be published? So it should be, well, the actual publication won't come out for several months because we have to submit the publication to a journal and then it gets peer reviewed. They peer review, yeah. It's sent out to independent experts. They always want revisions and send back. But what most scientists are doing during, especially during the age of COVID, is publishing a preprint. So once once the research is done and you're ready to submit it to a journal, you can put it out for public availability with the caveat that this has not been peer reviewed but then doctors can see it right away. They don't have to wait. And we expect to have that done within a month. Okay. Yeah. So very, very soon. exciting. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is very exciting. <laughs> yeah. Um, so is there anything else that you would like to share about the vaccine COVID-19 with mothers? And also, I guess, you shared a little bit before, which I would love to talk to you about it another time, some of the the getting into formula. And can you explain what you said, kind of like breaking it down and talking about different formulas? Sure. So that's completely unrelated to COVID-19, just babies in general. Um, I work with families who have a baby experiencing formula tolerance issues, which okay. is very common. And I know it's incredibly stressful for parents to face making a formula choice, especially if they had intended on exclusive breastfeeding and now they're faced with um, not have, not being able to do that and having to choose from the hundreds of formulas on the target aisle. So I do help families make ingredients-based decisions. So helping them to understand what are the nutritional differences between your formula options and how you would choose one over the other based on your baby's symptoms, their gestational age, you know, the things that make them their special, unique being. (laughs) So with all of that work that you do as well, have you seen a lot or heard a lot of questions about with COVID-19, if they're not able to exclusively breastfeed or supplementing, um, how formula plays into that? You know, I, there was a lot of concern at the peak of the pandemic early on about formula availability because there was, um, you know, we all ran out of toilet paper, but there was some panic buying of formula early on. And I will um, give a thank you that a lot of the formula manufacturers started working overtime, big time to be sure that, because there's nothing worse than having going to the store and not being able to get the formula that your baby is on. So I think we're far beyond that. There's no concerns about availability at the moment. Um, And I don't don't anticipate there being. I will say if you're supplementing with formula, I would say this not during a pandemic, but so, you know, our, our standard suggestion still applies that any breast milk you provide your baby is beneficial. So first of all, there's no room for guilt if you are only, if you're not breastfeeding at all, or if you're, yeah. if you're supplementing, whatever you're doing for your baby is perfect. If you are only able to provide your baby partial human milk, I don't want you to think that it's not enough. Whatever you're providing is just fine and keep up the great work providing your baby breast milk, however you're able to do that. And it fits in your family's needs. Right. And I love, I know, know breastfeeding formula feeding is such a tricky thing to talk about. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just want to put out, I'm always the fed is best, you know, (laughs) put the guilt away and we can look back and say, these people, this generation was primarily all formula fed. This generation was primarily breastfed and look, we're all here (laughs) and we're all doing well. So whatever it's, what is ever is going to keep you mentally healthy enough to be there for your child and bond with them. So, yeah, absolutely. And it's been uh, quite a challenge. I'm a mother of older children, so toddler age, and I literally can't imagine 
all, I mean, I work with moms every day, new moms, but having a baby during this pandemic time has just added an additional incredible layer of stress and isolation onto an incredibly stressful and isolating time in your life when you're dealing with hormones and feeding. And so if you, if that's you, if you're a mom with a pandemic baby, I just, I'm clapping my hands for you. You're doing an amazing job. The task that has been assigned to you is unfair and you're doing so, so well. So give yourself grace (laughs) and carry on. We're all rooting for you. (laughs) Yes. Yes. You, I love you put that so well uh, that it is definitely an unimagined and unfair task. Oh, totally. Um, Yes. Uh, So thank you. I know we your time is very valuable. So I want to thank you for sharing it and sharing your wisdom with us uh, and knowledge. Is there anything else that you want to leave moms with? You've already given us such amazing. Oh, thank you. Well, I'll leave with, I guess, two thoughts. One is our sort of general public public health announcement that if you do contract COVID-19, we just talked a lot about how you're still able to provide your baby really incredible breast benefits by continuing to provide breast milk. But of course, we still recommend that if you're nursing at the breast or when you're expressing your milk to wash your hands very carefully before you do so, and absolutely be sure to wear a mask because while you won't provide virus to your baby, beat your milk, of course, Mm -hmm. coughing or talking or kissing, which is so sad. Your baby is a potential route of transmission when you, when you're actively ill. So that's just a general reminder. And then The last one was, I think I already, already said it when I said, uh, this is an incredible stressful time for all parents, but to be parenting a new baby has just a lot of demands on you. So give yourself grace and you're doing a wonderful job. Yes. Well, thank you. Um, I forgot to ask you, what have you done for yourself today as a act of realistic self-care? That's what I always love to ask everybody. (laughs) Oh, That is a hard question, which is really embarrassing. Um, Do you know what I have? So we can see each other. I keep an adorable floral teapot in my office. So I come in and I make tea and I have a really pretty mug, which is the tiniest thing, but life is too short to drink tea out of an ugly mug. So it's the smallest thing that I really enjoy. So when I have a break in between meetings or something, I will make myself a cup of tea and drink it out of something pretty. <laughs> oh, you are not the only one. I've had that discussion with so many people. I have my little anxiety club. Love it. Anxious as a mother cup for when, you know, I can switch with side. What do I want? Yeah, how are we feeling today? Yes. All these other, yes, I love the mug. So that is an act of self-care. <laughs> yes, it's absolutely. <laughs> well, again, thank you so much. Oh, and, you're welcome. Um, I hope to talk to you another time. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to the conversation with Dr. Bridget Young as much as I did having it. I, You may have heard that we talked a little bit about her expertise uh, in helping new parents choosing different formulas for their children. So I plan on having her back relatively soon to discuss that topic. If you have questions about ways to help manage your mom's anxiety, as well as questions about exercise postpartum, what is safe, what is not, those are my specialties. After having my first child, I started a postnatal class that we did with our babies and found that it was a great resource for moms to help manage their brand new emotional needs with a child. And now that's where the Mom Anxiety Club was born from. So we get to exercise together and talk about the ups, downs, and anxieties of motherhood inside the Mom Anxiety Club. And right now there is a special for one-on-one work with me, and you can find that information in the show notes or at join.momsietyclub.com. There, you will also be able to find information about the Momsiety Club membership, where you get to talk with other moms, have support sessions, and access to 
classes that you can do with or without your little one, and so much more. And remember, a portion of all new memberships and the Ultimate Momsiety Club package are donated to a Children's Miracle Network hospital. Right now, we are donating to the Child Life Resources Fund at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, which helps make visits to the hospital a little easier and a little less out of control feeling for patients and parents. I look forward to chatting with you on social media as well as seeing you inside of the Momsiety Club. The Momsiety Club podcast is not intended to take place of medical advice or therapy. If you are in crisis, call your local emergency number or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. The Momsiety Club membership is full of a group of amazingly supportive moms and pre- and postnatal fitness tips and exercises to help you mentally and physically. The first month's fee for all new members this month is being donated to the Child Life Fund at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. When you're ready to join other mamas getting through the ups, downs, and anxieties of motherhood, head to join.momsietyclub.com to become a member 